And um, I love how the Bible, when it talks about lust, it doesn't just talk about women or men. It's not just a sexual term. You can lust after cars. You can lust after jobs. You can lust after houses. You can lust after careers. Yes. And I'm sure I'm missing a thousand different things. Right? So as I thought about this in writing the sermon, I thought, you know, aren't we all going through stuff? Don't we all have issues like this that we have to with? You know, um, isn't this a topic that that is really pertinent and re relevant to everybody here. So the Spirit reminded me there's a process in brokenness. And that being broken can be one of the most loving places that God can bring us. Because it is at brokenness, the state of being completely undone, where the Lord can show Himself supernatural in our lives. Obviously, you're not going to see it as a sweet state. It's only when you're on the other side and you see how in that moment where you felt like your life was going to end and he came in. Just like a hero who takes the stage. Right? I mean, it's like, that's who he was to me. And uh, I want to encourage you all, if you haven't seen it, I posted it on Facebook, but go watch the video by Mercy Me on this. And what it is, is they're all, they're all in white. Bright white, and the drum set's white, the sticks are white, the instruments are white, everything's white. And they start singing, and they're all covered in wet mud. Hmm. And then as they're singing the song, they reverse the sequence of them throwing the mud. So all the mud's getting lifted off of them. By the end of the song, they're all white. That's and cool. it's like, it's like the, that's what the Lord did for me. And that's what he did for you. In spite of the cigarettes, in spite of the porn, in spite of the anger, in spite of the selfishness, that is what your state is before God right now. Right now. If you were to die right now, you would see Jesus when you stand before his throne. And you don't deserve it, and I don't deserve it, and it doesn't mean that you can stay in that sin and that God doesn't mind. Of course he minds. Of course he wants to see you stepping up into holiness. You know? He is conforming you into his son's image. And that, that image does not get angry um, without reason yeah. and sin. It does, not, it does not gravitate towards the flesh at all. So he is, by default, he is changing you and he is calling you to fight. Mm -hmm. And it's a sweet state when you reach that point because, you know, the first thing we do is we fight. It's just that God's not really in it. We're trying to do it by our own strength. Maybe we're trying to do it in a uh, less than sincere way. We're still making place for the sin. Right? Well, uh, you know, uh, an example of that would be me smoking the cigarettes and doing what I said I was doing. But just doing that, knowing I wasn't really, I wasn't concerned about quitting, you know, I, I, I cut down. No, that wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't to cut down. You see, that's the difference. You know, my goal was to overcome. Because the Bible says, I am an overcomer. Amen? Alright, so having gone through this, you know, so then I'm like, alright, I'm going to make a sermon out of this. And, uh, and I had to think about what, what were the steps that I went through every single time that I can nail down for you today. And I had four of them. And the first one was the brokenness, on brokenness. Because... The first place you are is broken, right? Um, King David's the textbook example of brokenness. All right, and I'm going to get to King David in a little bit. The first one's on brokenness. The second one is on being disciplined by the Lord. You know, before you're broken, before you reach that place where He can come in, He's going to discipline you because you're still doing it, right? And He's bringing you to the place where you're undone. And really, it's up to us in this stage of how far it goes. You know, uh, three is the cure, and four is the restoration. Okay, so I got some scriptures here. I decided I wasn't going to make a sermon today. I was just going to give you the scriptures. There's a lot. Uh, I may not talk about each one, but this is what the Lord wanted. Amen. 
Mm. Alright, the first one is our scripture for today, which is Psalm 51, 17. Father God, I come before you, Lord, as your servant, as a flawed man, Lord God, and uh, asking you, Holy Spirit, to speak through me. Guide my lips, guide my mind, guide my heart. Father, we're all struggling with sin. We all have our own issues. Some like to think theirs aren't as bad as others, where in fact, we're all on the same stage. We're on the same, same level playing field of being sinners. But Lord, you've covered us. Please use us today, Lord. Speak to me today, Lord God. May these words cause deliverance on somebody, Lord. Cure, restore, in the name of Jesus. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Why won't he despise a broken and contrite heart? Well, a broken heart isn't playing games anymore. Mm. A broken and contrite heart is not saying you want deliverance, saying you're fighting, but knowing in the back of the mind of your mind is no real hurry because everybody does this and I can't really see that's ever going to change. Right? I've done it. I've got that t-shirt. Um, He will not despise a heart that is in the fight and willing to do whatever it takes and, and just broken, and realizing that it, it can't really do anymore. You can't really do anymore, that you need the Lord. Yeah. If, I don't, if I don't, Lord, if you don't step in, I'm going to lose everything. Lord, please step in. That's the kind of prayer that the Lord loves to hear. Right? Um, there's a song Amy Grant did, Better Than a Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I'm talking about, you know. You know, he likes hallelujah, but not when you're playing games with sin. Yeah. What's more what, what's, what's uh, more touching to him is when you stop shouting hallelujah and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you. I can't do this. So why are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart something, uh, a sacrifice towards God, as opposed to singing worship, as opposed to having mercy, right? I mean, th these are also sacrifices unto the Lord. But in the area of brokenness, the broken heart, uh, spirit and the contrite heart is also considered a sacrifice to God. Why? Can you guess that right thing? Sure, she will be for Yes. Because of the pain. But you're right. Because of the pain that you've inflicted on yourself and your family, that you've finally reached the point where you're laying before the Lord and saying, God, help me. Save me. You know, my first pastor used to say one of the most basic prayers is, and it's true. When it comes from, it's it's uh it's it's guttural, man. It's it's what's the word I'm looking for? Car, not carnal. Uh, it's it prim primeval. It's primitive. It's just you, man. No pretenses. Yes. Um, it's pretty much the same concept of when Jesus was walking with the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners. You know, and you know, some of his disciples asked him, you know, why do you, why do you <coughs> eat amongst, eat amongst the crowds of, of sinners? Yep. He said, because those are the ones who need the help the most. Yeah. And yeah. this, you know, same thing like you say about the contrite, broken heart. You know, you know, God's not going to despise it because you know, it, it, it is a broken heart. Obviously, you know, that broken heart needs God the most. Yeah. Yeah. And there's an innocence in. You know, I don't care how conniving you've been in the past, when you reach the state of brokenness, there's an innocence to that. Because you're admitting your failings before God. And you're totally at his mercy for him to deliver you, or or your life is destroyed. You know? Psalm 34, 18 through 19. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted 
and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Did you hear that, saints? The Lord delivers them out of them all. Not the Lord may deliver. Not the Lord sometimes delivers. Not that it, it's, it's only possible some of the time and God can't do it all the time. No. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. See, when we, when we talk about brokenness, we, we have to use words like crushed, mm. destroyed, broken, undone. You can't say wounded. That's not broken. Right? right. Amen. Amen. Next verse, next to that, is referred to uh, Jesus in the document of the cross. Um, not only his bones, but his bones. I'm just curious. It is, it's must be. Okay. Alright, Isaiah 57 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up. Who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. You see, God is not out to get you. God is not interested in seeing you suffer any more than you have to. God is not interested in having you remain in your sin when he can deliver you. He's not interested in that. Now, I don't know about you, but my experience has been very few times has the Lord done this in my life. The smoke of cigarettes was one of those times. All right? um, in prayer, he has answered prayers like that. You know, the church being here is an answer to prayer. We wanted to go to North Carolina. He said he was being made perfectly clear. Amen. We see that in, uh, that in answer to the verse we just went over, his desire is not to judge, but to restore and to revive. And it goes on and on and on. There's so many scriptures on uh, God's uh, willingness. Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Matthew 5.3-4. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, poor in spirit and mourn are both brokenness. He's saying those who are broken. When you are broke before God, you are you are poor in spirit, man. Obviously, you're mourning, and you're mourning. Uh, you're not mourning for that poor sinner over there. You're mourning because you realize your state. You know how, how much you've come short of of who God is and, and and His best for you. You know, I I deal with that all the time. I want to be everything that the Lord has for me. He is doing his work in me according to his plan and his time. Now, the times when I fall, when I make a mistake, when I sin, are not his plan. No. All right? But his daily sanctification of me, which is an ongoing progressive process, is his plan. No. Right? No. And he has made, thank God, he has made um, a condition for me where I can be restored when I do make my mistakes. No. I can go to the Lord. <clears throat> Right? Right. In brokenness, we are destroyed by the sin and its consequences. And if God does not intervene, the issue will destroy parts of my life which I cannot bear to lose. You see? In brokenness, what you can lose are things you can't bear to lose. All right? Now, the, the best illustration for the opposite of that I can give you is heroin addicts and crack addicts and meth addicts. They'll give up everything for that. Right? But we're, I'm the same way when I'm playing games with my anger. I'm the same way when I'm playing games with the stronghold that um, you may be dealing with. Right? But then you reach that point where the the Lord is disciplining you, man. He's coming in, and he's, and he's doing things, and he's revealing it, and you're being exposed, and, 
and you're, you're getting all these ramifications and reaches the point where it's going to take from you something you can't bear to lose. Wife, family, house, car, dog, job, whatever it is. Boyfriend, girlfriend, kids, right? But until you reach that place where it's actually taking away things you can't bear to lose, the deliverance won't come. Right? Um, you can say to the crackhead, uh, the person addicted to crack or meth or heroin, when CPS comes in and takes the kids, obviously they're mad, they're upset, mm. but do they stop using? No. 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 So really, what was the priority? The drug. That's not brokenness. No matter how much of a storm you raise up because they're doing this, or you're losing whatever it is you're losing, if you continue in the sin, then you weren't broken. If that thing that you thought was the thing you can't bear to lose does not uh, usher in deliverance, then you weren't really broken. You're still playing. Still playing games. Still caught in the stronghold. Scriptures on being disciplined. Proverbs 12, 1. You're good. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I laughed when I read that. I'm like, wow. The ESV says that. It's like, you're stupid. If you don't like discipline, whether it be from God, or your pastor, or your, your accountability partner, obviously somebody that you trust uh, enough to put in that kind of esteem, right? If whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Because when you're disciplined, it's an opportunity for you to grow, to humble yourself, to admit your flaws, to learn something constructive. It's There's no lose scenario in, in receiving discipline, all right? As long as it's not abuse, obviously. But he who hates reproof is stupid. So I had to look up the New Living Translation because I love the New Living Translation. It's, it's a more modern paraphrase. I want to see what they have to say. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. I can't tell you how many Christians I've counseled who refuse to take... Nancy and I have a joke, we say. We want them to go left, we tell them to go right. right? It's no different than the world. It's sad. It's really sad. What we do as Christians is we shout the hallelujahs and we, and we say that we're different than the world and we forward doctrines that are opposite to the world until we are the ones who are in the spotlight. And then all of a sudden, all the reactions are the same as the world. And that's sad. Now, that's not true for everybody. It's something we all have to overcome because it's something we all go through. But based on where you are in the Lord, you may or may not act that way. A Christian will humble themselves and allow the correction to come in. If they have disagreements, it'll be discussed. Right? Yes. You won't have the running out the doors screaming curses at you. <coughs> right. All right? Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Um, I was talking, I forget if it was a Bible study or um, in last week's sermon or a prayer, but, you know, we're delivered from Torah. We're no longer under Torah. We don't have to keep the Torah. We are not Jews. We're, we're spiritual Israel, right? Um, we're Gentiles. We're, we're, we were heathens. Uh, they're, these are people who don't believe in the God of Isaac. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? We came to the Lord under the New Covenant, under the New Testament, and the uh, old is now obsolete. Okay? Unless something from Torah is confirmed by Christ in the New Testament as something we're bound to, such as honor thy, uh, love thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All right. Um, the whole concept of discipline, of Old Testament discipline, is carried over into the New Testament. All right. So there are def definite things from the old that we are bound to in the New Testament. 
Homosexuality is a sin in the Old Testament. Homosexuality is a sin in the New Testament. Lying is a sin in the Old Testament. Lying is a sin in the New Testament. How do I know? It says it. That's all. I take the, I read the Word of God. My apple. I read the Word of God, and what it says, I believe. I don't try to play games. I don't try to twist it. I believe it. All right. I was in a cult. I know what it means to be deceived. I will not be deceived again. And I will not lead you into deception by playing with your sin, by coddling your sin. Um, there's mercy, there's grace, and there's discipline. Amen? Amen. Amen? The rod is for correction. I always talk about that. And people, you know, some people say that's not right, but I know it's right. The shepherd has a crook. The crook is to guide the sheep, you know? Stop crowding up, guys. Separate. You know, the sheep gets caught in the ditch. You use the crook, you grab him by the neck, pull him out. The rod is a billy club. That's for correction. It's for self, it's for defense also against the wolves. But it's also for correction of the sheep. All right. Yes. You said you were part of the cult. Yes, Scientology. Say that again. Scientology. Scientology. Which is? Well, I, I really don't want to get into it right now. It's a, uh, it's, it's it's a false religion. Many years ago. Very good. Um, we can talk. I can give you more of an explanation later. It's just not a sermon on Scientology. All right, so Proverbs 3, 11, 12. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline, and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Now, here's the carryover to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 13. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses your sons? My son, my daughter. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. I just I, I don't want to yeah, I don't want to be exclusive. Uh, for what son is there whom the father does not discipline or do? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Anyone who can relate to that? Right? Um, but later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, this is my favorite line, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Don't you love how God, this is like the Old Testament when, you know, um, when Joshua and Israel were going up to um, Jericho, and the angel, I think it was Jesus, was there, and he said, hey, Joshua's like, friend or foe, you know, and he's like, yeah. yeah, he says, I'm the captain of the guard, you know, and he goes, I want you to do this, the Lord will fight for you, so do this, right? He always did that in the Old Testament, I will fight for you, now go fight. It's always a cooperative endeavor. He isn't just saying, you stay there, I'll go fight. Never. No. No. Oh, I, with me with cigarettes, he did that. For those last three. All right? With lust, for me, he did that. All right? Up until that point, though, see, <laughs> it's like he proves us when, when we're battling a stronghold. He causes us to have to fight, and then at the very last second, he comes in, man. He just delivers you. Deliverance is a is only a, it's a, totally a work of God. You have no that final act of deliverance is totally God. You have nothing to do with it. It's a holy act. The fact that God has disciplined you or is disciplining you, that He uh, reveled 
reveal the sin or correct you sharply in some other way is proof of his love. I always say, don't be, don't be mad or upset or, or concerned that he's disciplining you or reproving you. Be upset and worried when he stops. Because when he stops, that means that your heart's been hard to the point where he's no longer going to try to see, he's turning you over to the sin. We are his children. We are his sons and daughters. Oh, that we would accept and receive his correction, no matter how hard it is. It is for our sake he disciplines. So what does these scriptures I just read, what do they say about um, the process and the fruit and all that stuff? His discipline will bring growth and strength if, only if, we allow it to do its work in us. Anyone can fight discipline and get nothing out of it. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. But when you allow it to, to, um, to shape you, he will do a work in us. The work of God's discipline is to bring about holiness. That's what he's doing in each of us. You, and and he's, the writer here makes a comparison between fatherly discipline and godly discipline. You know, fatherly discipline is also for your good most of the time, unless it's not. But it doesn't, at best, it'll produce a change in your behavior, but it's got really nothing to do with holiness or salvation or righteousness, anything like that. It's just getting you to do something that is not destructive as opposed to destructive. Right? Godly discipline is a higher form of discipline than earthly discipline. Okay? If we would reject his discipline, the spirit will stop trying. Your heart will be hardened and you shall become illegitimate children. His discipline will bring about righteousness in you. Right? A change in you. Don't you all want more righteousness? I do. It's not about pride for me. It's just simply about... Look, Father, I'm doing, I did it. I'm not doing this anymore, you know? To know that he's so pleased because, you know, it was a hard fight. It was, it was hard fought. But the victory came, and, and, and I'm this much closer to his image. It's awesome. I love it. His discipline will bring about righteousness in us if we would allow ourselves to be trained by it. Now, that was an interesting word. Train. What happens in training? Do you, when you start training, are you at the end of your training? No. You're at the beginning of your training. Still got the belly. It's like boxing, all right? Still got the belly. Uh, Dorrance isn't really where it should be, right? And training is a process where uh, the, ex, the, the training gets more and more difficult, lengthy, deeper, harder, and during the process, your body is changing, and your mind is changing, mm -hmm. right? And that's what God does when you have a stronghold sin that you're not releasing. Mm -hmm. He starts a process of training in you called discipline. Mm -hmm. And God is faithful. He doesn't just quit on you after the first failure, no. right? But he's turning you into a mighty warrior. You already are a mighty warrior in Jesus Christ. He is bringing you into that reality. Because let's be real, the amount of sin that we have in our lives prevents us, keeps us from exercising our full strength in Jesus Christ against the enemy. So we're fighting against the enemy. Right? Therefore, right? So God is going to do all this. He's going to increase the discipline, increase the revealing. You're going to get embarrassed by your sin. You're going to get hurt by your sin. You're going to hurt others by your sin. Right? And you're going to reach that point of brokenness. And he's going to be saying to you, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Mm -hmm. I am fighting for you. Fight. Mm -hmm. Feel the renewed strength of the Holy Spirit in you to do this. You're not going to do it on your own. You have to call out to God. You've got to get on your knees and cry out to God and say, Lord, give me the strength. I want my walk to be straight. I don't want it to be the zigzag walk that goes off into bars and, and nightclubs and, and you know fornication and adultery and all this other stuff. I'm sick of it. I am sick of it. My spirit mind abhors my flesh mind. 
The Cure. Psalm 51. I, I almost felt like reading the whole psalm. Because it's just so... It's my... This is my psalm. People say, what's your scripture? Psalm 51 is mine. Because it's what he did. No, 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 Ali. Page? I shall need glasses. Okay, so what is um, precipitating this psalm? Anybody? David had an affair with Bathsheba. And that's just one aspect of what David did. Yeah. David saw Bathsheba. Uh, I have a feeling she knew that, he, you know, she's on her roof bathing naked yeah. inside of the palace. Yeah. All right? Don't be a rocket scientist to know that there might have been something she was interested in. Mm -hmm. But that's besides the point. That's not the point here at all. The point is that David coveted her, a married woman. Mm -hmm. So he had her, and then he decided that he wanted her husband dead so he could really have her. Mm -hmm. So he had her husband killed. And, it broke, and this is King David. This is the, the major Christ type of the Bible. It just goes to show you that Christ types are not perfect. They don't always talk about Christ. David, in this instance, was there was nothing about Christ in this. All right? This was David acting in the flesh. All right? He broke all ten commandments. In this, in this one thing, he broke every commandment. All right? And then he, he, he didn't try to cover it up, but there was nothing to cover up. He just let things go. And God went to Nathan the prophet, who was David's prophet. And David and Nathan went up to him and he said, you know, there's this guy and, you know, he wanted something. And he took it. And it really wasn't his to take. And, you know, what should we do? And David got all indignant. He said, we should kill him. Put him to death. And Nathan goes, you are that man. And, you know, you think about King David and why he's considered righteous. And then you look at someone like Judas and you consider why he's not. All right? And the only way you can figure that out, you know, resolve that, is that, you know, he repented of what he needed to repent of. All right? Mm -hmm. Judas did not. Judas repented of selling out Jesus. He threw the coins back. And then he hung himself. But he did not repent unto salvation because he wouldn't have hung himself. Maybe he didn't repent of stealing the money. Remember the money? Money bag? He was the money bag guy. He was dipping his hands in the whole time. Remember all the criticisms of Judas of Jesus Christ? Never repented of those, did he? Whatever. We can speculate to the cows come home. David repented. And here is his repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. You know what he's saying? You'd be just to send me to hell. That's what he said. He said, Lord, I deserve hell. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice in the Lord's discipline. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressions your way and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, 
and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart of God you will not despise. That was our opening scripture. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Here's a man who um, humbled himself before God. Yes, he, it didn't happen until he got caught. I want to point that out. And um, that's okay. As long as the revealing, the, you know, this goes into what I was saying before about, you know, being accountable to somebody. Do you receive that discipline? If I went up to you to talk to you about a sin, would you stop and really take a look at it, or would you just blow me off? Hmm. And you can blow me off by saying, well, thank you, Pastor. I'll, I'll pray on that. I'll think about that. And, and really, you're not. You know you're not. All right? Um, will you be open to discipline by the Lord or by those who are um, accountable for you? Right. You know, I, I had, this is part of the sermon I preached at Illinois Community Church two weeks ago when I was there. Um, it was on unity. And um, I was talking about uh, the unity of the church to the church. You need to be united with him. You need to be united with her. You need to be united with her. You need to be united with her. There is no room for um, hatred, bitterness, or unforgiveness in this church. In the church of Christ, no room. If you have an issue with somebody, you have to go to them and be reconciled. It's, if, if you have an issue with somebody, you're the one with the issue. It's an offense. You need to go and speak to that person. That's, Christ, that's Christian. It's the Christian way. Right? But then the other part of my sermon was about there needs to be unity between you and me. Because look, I'm not above you, but the Lord has placed me in a position of teaching and preaching and leading and shepherding. Yeah. All right? And what I have found is, for the most part, if I'm your friend before you come to this church, I will never be a pastor. Because you will never look to me as... Somebody, I mean, what could possibly be going on here? Um, it's almost impossible because friends always think that they're they're um, they're on level ground with you, so that you can't really speak into their lives. And yeah, I agree. I, I don't lord it over anybody, but if I'm in a pastoral role over anybody, then I need to be able to speak into your life. I need to be able to say, brother, sister, that was wrong. But what happens with friends is they usually get really offended and they leave. Right? This is my experience. Uh, the other experience I've, I've encountered is when people who are older than me come in. It's very difficult for me to be their pastor. Because there's this, inside there, there's this, I've been doing this a lot more, longer than you, are, you have. And clearly I can speak into your life, Pastor. I'm not quite sure I want you speaking into mine. And um, it's never a, um, a, a mean, um, self-righteous kind of thing, although it is at heart. It's, it's more of a subtle condescension. All right? Where the, the bottom line in the matter is the old, young, friend, not friend, if you, the Lord has placed you into a church, then he has placed you under a pastor for leadership and for guidance and for teaching and for preaching. And, um, and, and pastors are called shepherds because they're called to guide and they're called to correct and protect. Right? So that was what my sermon was on um, over there. And, you know, it, it goes in right and perfectly with this, with talking about discipline. We, we need to be able to receive. Now, that doesn't mean that the pastor has any right to abuse you, or the church member has any right to abuse you. Okay? And there are ways to resolve that if you feel that. If you feel that, then you bring in a third party. Yes. What does the Bible say? You bring in two witnesses. Mm -hmm. Right? You got an issue, you're talking to the person about them not receiving it, go get two more people, 
Well, actually, it's one more. It's on, it's on two or three. So one or two more people, and you go to that person. Right? That's how you resolve it. And then if they still don't, uh, it gets worse. Anyway, um, we're not going to go there. The cure. Let's talk about the cure. All right? Enough of discipline. Psalm 51, we just read, uh, David went before the Lord in humility and honesty <coughs> and brokenness brings both. When you are broken, you will finally become totally honest. You know, up till now, I really, I know I, I was saying I wanted to overcome this, but I really have. <laughs> I really have. I mean, I'm still, you know, it's just being honest. Isaiah 61, 1. Through two, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I love that. And you know, these are the words that Jesus spoke. His first public ministry. Would you say he, Psalm 51? Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. These are the words that Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 4 when he read the scrolls. Mm -hmm. And that this is the the, the thing that he read is just such a blessing. He's, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he's binding up the brokenhearted. Jesus is the cure. That's, that's the short story. Jesus is your cure. It is Jesus who will come in by his spirit and renew you and deliver you. Right? When you hit that spot of broken heartedness, all right? To bind up, you, want, you know what it means? To wrap firmly, to compress, to stop the bleeding of the heart, mm. to govern, to wrap about, and to heal. And that's what Jesus wants to do in your life, whatever the stronghold is. But you need to get to that place of brokenness. <coughs> that place of, you know, you picture a heart and, and just start, you know, it's, it's one muscle and it's feeding. You just picture ripping it up into pieces, yet it's staying all together, you know, not fully ripped. And it's, just, it's just a mess. It doesn't function anymore. And then Christ comes with his Holy Spirit duct tape and he wraps it around it and it's all back together. And it's beating, and it's beating, all of a sudden the tape disappears and it's whole. The discipline is the duct tape. Don't you know when you rip a muscle, it hurts? Yeah. You know, if, if you rip a muscle and you go to put it back together, it's going to hurt. Yes. So does discipline. Mm -hmm. So does discipline. Mm -hmm. But if there's a healing and there's a deliverance waiting for you. Hebrews 14, uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. All right. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Because Christ was tempted in every single way you were, he can deliver you from every temptation. Yeah. You know, they say man who created in the image of God. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I'm listening to everything you're saying. Um, and my mind is still kind of like stuck on what you was the topic you were speaking of with King David and the Shema. Mm -hmm. You do believe in divine intervention, right? Mm -hmm. What was meant to happen will happen. So that was obviously meant to happen. You you don't believe you don't you don't, you don't think so? Okay. Um, Who's to say that Uriah wouldn't have gotten killed six months down the road and then David would have hooked up with Bathsheba? Well, according to the Bible, what happened happened. It's already set in stone. So, it's, you know, it's meant to happen, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you yourself are a king of your own world, you know, in the image of God. You know, if you was in that situation, um, do you feel as though you would deserve to be deprived from love? 
and <coughs> you knew that she had nothing for you, and you knew that she was probably the best one for you. Bathsheba. Just speaking in general, what, yeah. what, we were using King David. If I am using was, adultery to get what I want, I am out of God's will. Mm -hmm. End of story. End of story. And that's the whole point of Psalm 51. You would be right in your judgment against me. Well, we were born in sin. Yeah, but I don't want to debate with you here. All right, so we can finish this conversation afterwards. But look, we're all born in sin. But that doesn't mean God winks at our sin. What does it say in Acts? In times past, he winked at sin, but now calls every man to repent. Okay? We are not allowed to say, I believe the Lord told me that I'm supposed to marry his wife. That's not God. That's not God. You know? Now, God can use any circumstance, all right, if we are faithful and, and bring good out of it, but sin is never God's will. I don't see the sin in that. I really don't. In adultery? No, I understand. In murder? <laughs> no, I understand. The in coveting? And in murder. Dishonoring God by doing that? And coveting. But I, 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 I see, I look, at, I look more optimistically instead of pessimistically towards, towards that way. Do you tell me how Psalm 51 in any way is optimistic? David's optimistic and before God. Well, he made, he made her his wife. That, that's, that's a <coughs> We'll talk about this later, right? Because uh, this is not my sermon. My sermon is my sermon. But we can talk afterwards. Okay? I can't have a 20 minute conversation with you about this. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have time to talk afterwards either. I was just trying to, before I left, trying to get an understanding. Because in my mind, I'm the king of my own world. Actually, my, I write down. <laughs> no, you're not. And, and my God's music. the king of your own world. <laughs> you're his servant. You're his bond servant. I said in my mind. In well, my, then in change my, your mind, brother, because yeah. that's wrong. In my mind, I'm the king of my own world. That's sad. And, and a reflection of that. I'm an image, uh, I'm a um, creation in the image of God. And, um, you know, I understand I'm not perfect. No man is perfect. I understand we're both perfect for the sin. We're all sinners. You know, you know, if they say you're not a sinner, you'd be lying yourself. That would be a sin. Right. In yourself, we're all sinners. No, right. no, no man is perfect. You know, however, you know, God does forget. And we, and we know we know God does forget. That, that doesn't mean that we take advantage or anything like that. Well, when does God forgive? What's the basis of his forgiveness? Repentance. I just believe that if, if, if I just believe that being that man in the image of God, if, if there was something that was meant to be in our life, divine intervention is going to be. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't think there's nothing well, wrong. I'm sorry if you find adultery to be acceptable, or fornication to be acceptable, or murder to be acceptable, as long as God is going to accomplish something with that, and that's how you rationalize it. All right, that's wrong. <coughs> So you can't be optimistic and say, praise the Lord, I'm going to commit adultery, but God's going to use it. I'm not, I mean, the way you say it, it, it sounds worse than what it is. I want it to sound worse he, than what it is. He was a king. <laughs> like, 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 keeping it in text, like, in context, he was a king. He was a king. If he wanted to kill a thousand men and take a thousand men's wives, he could have did that. He was a king. Like, and you know, happened, you know what would have happened if he did that? You know what would have happened? It would have said at the end of David's story, and David did evil all the days of his life in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, well, you know, God, when he, when his wrath comes, how many times has he killed thousands of people because they were sinners over God's God. sovereign. God can do whatever he wants. Because he's never evil so, and so sinful in his acts. A man in the image of God, a king, if a king goes to war and kills thousands You're not God. Of his enemy. You're not God. Nobody is God. But I'm saying a man in the image of God, if, if, if a king goes to war in the What part of adultery is sin, don't you understand? I think we're on two different pages. Because I understand what you're saying, adultery and sin, but I'm speaking of a king who has the power, who has the power to to, to Yeah, to, you see what you're doing? Because I understand what you're saying, but what you're what you're doing is raising yourself up because he's your example. You're king of your world, therefore I can do as David did. No, God gave King David the power. This is what I'm talking about, about being willing to hear. All right? God gave you the power, too, to choose sin or to choose um, obedience. Right? See this? That's the tree of the, of the fruit of the knowledge, fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you go like this, 
and take a bite out of it, you're making your own decisions. I'm a child of God, I'm a king, I can do this. I don't care if adultery is a sin, I'm going to use that, and God's going to make that, it's going to all work out. Instead of, adultery is a sin. No. Fornication is a sin. David was not justified in what he did. He was forgiven because he repented. Right. So there's no justification there in adultery or any sin. There's no excuse for that. No. But David, King David did repent. Yeah. He did. He did ask God. And he was forgiven. Was, and he was forgiven. Absolutely. And he kept his right. Yep. And Solomon was born out of that. So I don't see that. what, what was wrong with that. I really don't. I mean, he can't. I'm sorry you don't see that. Because that, that just means that there's something morally off. Because if you can't see that the adultery and the murder and was not justified, and God forgave him anyway, then I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not saying the adultery and murder wasn't justified. I'm saying that God forgave him. And being that she, was, she remained his wife and they conceived a child, King Samuel, out of that, that means that it was God's plan for that to happen. No, it means that God used it. But it wasn't his I mean, original purpose. It was his plan. If it happened, it happened. You can't take it back. Didn't they lose a child, too? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, about that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 If it was meant, if God has it meant to happen, it's, it's not. I'm just going to give you a warning. Your rationale will lead you down a road of sin. Be very careful. Be very, very careful. See what Jesus has to say about sin. All right? Because... What you're doing is justifying evil. Regardless of how God used it or what he did with it, it all started with David repenting, admitting what I did was evil. And God did not respond and go, that's okay, I meant you to do that. No, not at all. He had consequences. Consequences. And you will have consequences. Yeah, right? What was the consequence? He, he, he bore another king, King Samuel. And King Samuel was the greatest king ever. He was the king, king of Solomon. Was, Solomon. Oh. Right, he was the king of Solomon. Right, King Solomon. Was Best king, king ever, right? He was the king of all yeah. knowledge, all wisdom. Had a thousand wives. And God loved worshipped him. on the, all the hills, rebuilt all the uh, idol, all the idol places of idol worship. And God loved him. God, God adored him because. God yeah, but you see, you, you don't even know the whole story, of King Solomon. Uh, king Solomon. In the end, he fell. I do. Know and that. then he repented. I do know the whole story. You see, but you can't justify his sin because he repented. And say that was God. You can't do that. I'm not justifying anything. All I'm saying is divine intervention. I think we're seeing it in two different pages. I'm saying divine intervention. You're saying the sin. I'm saying what was meant to happen ha happened. And we can't take it back. It's in the scriptures. It's in the Bible. You can't pull the pages out of the Bible and well, take it back. We'll just agree to disagree. Can I say something? It no, 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 no. Thank you. Okay. Scriptures on restoration. 1 John 2, 1 through 6. My little children, I am writing these things to show you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So are you abiding in him? Are you seeking to walk in the ways that he dictates in his word? All right. Surely you can be if you're making place for sin. Not totally. I mean, your heart's desire can be to serve him and to live for him and to walk with him. But every time we choose to do what's against his will, we're taking a bite off of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Choosing to do what we will. Are you abiding in the Lord? What does it mean to abide in the Lord? It means stay in him. Stop leaving his presence for whatever it is, which has brought you to a place of brokenness. And then um, a wonderful scripture that was, was showed to me this week, that this happened within the church, which was really cool. James 5.16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. 
And it just goes to show, you know, because there are those in, in the born again church, especially, that don't really obey that scripture. They believe that they can go before the throne of grace of God. All truth. Go before the grace, throne of grace of God. Confess my sins to God. He's my high priest. He's my forgiveness. I don't need to tell you my sins. I don't need to tell you my sins. But this is a scripture about accountability. Um, I, I don't forgive your sins. But when you're trying to overcome something that you're struggling with, to confess that to another person brings it to light. All right? Not just between you and God, but it's somebody who sees you day to day, and you see them, and, and, and they can help you uh, walk with you, hold you accountable, if it means correction, love, rebuke, whatever it means. All right? But it usually, when you get to that point, you're usually getting to the place of brokenness, where you're, you're desperate enough that you're willing to tell somebody else your sin, as a measure just to try to get you to overcome. Amen? Amen. Amen. Confessing your sin to one another is a great aid in overcoming that sin, because you take the confessions outside of the prayer closet, where God and only God knows about it, and you expose yourself to light by sharing it with someone you trust. This puts the confessor on the road to the battle to victory. On the road to the battle and the victory. Alright, and then I'm going to close with these last words right here. Revelation 3.19-22 Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We're all sinners, right? But we are all also on a path to uh, perfection. Right? There will be no sin in heaven, and your whole walk here on earth is just a holiness walk where you're, you're learning the ways of God, you're going through your struggles, you're being disciplined by the Lord, you're learning, you're becoming more and more righteous in the flesh, because in the spirit, it's all done. Christ accomplished it all. all right? and, um, and he's bringing us to the place of confronting those things that are the real barriers that are holding us back from true intimacy with God. And it's a sweet place to be. Um, I know, even though it's very painful, it's never sweet when you're in it. Right? But when you're past it, like I am today with the insomnia and RLS, and I look back at how I saw him moving throughout the process, not abandoning me, but being with me, I see how sweet it is. Right? So I want to encourage every single one of you here to not give up. If you're entertaining uh, the sin that you that you say that you, you want to give up and you're praying to the Lord about it, but you're still kind of making place for it, then it's time to stop. It's time to cry out to the Lord. And let Him heal you. Amen? Amen. 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 Father God, I thank you for this word, Lord. And I ask that uh, each one of us, Lord, would just continue in your grace, continue in your holiness, continue in your love, Lord God. And Lord, may we never, never excuse our sin as your will. The fact that you can use everything, Lord, doesn't mean that everything's okay. May we each walk closer to you, Lord, with each passing day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. We're